I recognize the member from Windsor Tecumseh. Thank you, Speaker. We all have to live by the rules, but sometimes I think it'd be okay if we bent the rules on compassionate grounds from time to time. Diane Costello is in hospice care in Windsor. She's been there for three weeks. She doesn't have much time left. She wants to see her parents before she dies. Her parents live in Michigan. They came to Windsor two days ago, but the rules say that she must remain or they must remain in quarantine for two weeks. The clock is ticking, Speaker. Time is running out. The family has reached out to the Prime Minister's office. They've been trying to convince public health officials to make an exception. Diane was diagnosed with cancer two years ago. In March, her doctors told her the treatment wasn't working anymore. Her time has come, and she accepts that. We here in this chamber talk a lot about cutting red tape. The rules are the rules. But as Diane Costello puts it, her parents brought her into this world, and more than anything, she wants to see them, hug them, and say goodbye before she has to leave this world. It's her dying wish. It may take a miracle, but in cases such as this, perhaps bending the rules and compassionate grounds just may, might be the right thing to do. I call on the federal government to do the right thing for Diane Costello and anyone else in a similar situation. Speaker, I don't know if you saw the national news last night. The feds granted an exemption to billionaire buddies of Donald Trump to come here, hold a staff meeting, and not wear masks. If they can make quarantine exemptions for buddies of Trump, they sure as hell can give Diane Costello the chance to hug her parents, shed a few tears before she passes away. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Mississauga Malton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, imagine a 15-year-old child, son of a Canadian citizen who had been living in Canada for over 10 years trying to become financially independent, who has a job but cannot work legally. Or another 14-year-old girl who was sent to Canada by an adult relative to live with another relative in Canada, supposedly to get a better education and a better life, but who has actually been trafficked. Wonder what happened with these people, with these children. Thanks to the Child Welfare Immigration Center of Excellence, Mr. Speaker, they both are safe. These are just some of the examples of over 900 plus referrals received by the center in the last two years. Launched in 2018, based in Mississauga Malton, the Child Welfare Immigration Center of Excellence is part of the Peel CES, the first of its kind to help all children aid societies across Ontario to address immigration issues. Just in short period of time, the center has supported 23 Canadian children to return home safely from 13 countries, supported 83 children from 61 countries who came to Ontario unaccompanied and separated from their parents. I would like to thank our Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issue, Minister Jill Dunlop, for your tireless efforts in announcing an annual investment of 200000 for this program. This investment will ensure that these children have the support they need for building a strong future in our province. Mr. Speaker, and to the CEO, Rav Baines, and the dedicated staff at Peel CAS, I want to say a big thank you to you for making a difference in the lives of these children and making Mississauga Malton your home. I wish you blessings and success in supporting our communities forever. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Thunder Bay, Atacocan. Thank you, Speaker. There is one area of our pandemic response that cannot be repeated in the second wave or any time in the future. That is the treatment and abuse of residents in long-term care and congregate care settings. Beside the stories that I heard back in the riding, on Tuesday night I had the privilege of hearing the stories of families from across the North on a call with the Ontario North Family Councils Network. Their experiences were truly heartbreaking, and for those of us who have been sounding the alarm, it confirmed our worst fears. Family members confirmed the physical neglect lack of dental and foot care, devastating weight loss, dehydration, and mental deterioration. They consistently praised the staff and again and again talked about how more staff were needed. People who love and care for them could not be there. Those who wanted to take their parents or family out of a home were threatened that no place would be there after the pandemic. 
We don't need directives that are inconsistently applied, but laws with mandated levels of care that provide the time to properly look after people. Family and caregivers are needed in our long-term care system, and some families need to be the voice for the voiceless. We must ensure people in long-term care and group homes have consistent, continuous, and safe access to their essential caregivers. We know more now. We can do better. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Scarborough, Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a heartwarming number of our local businesses, organizations, and individuals have voluntarily taken action to help respond to COVID-19 crisis. Individuals delivered groceries, hot meals, and medicine to their neighbors. Businesses donated PPE to our local frontline workers and food to our local food banks. These donations during the last six months also demonstrated that Ontarians, regardless of their background, stand shoulder to shoulder to defeat the COVID-19 scourge. Heartfelt acts like these show how the spirit of Ontario can bring communities together at these difficult times. As a small token of my appreciation, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to CCGT, Canada Kangdong Chamber of Commerce, CCCO, Canada Confederation of Fujian Associations, CTCCO, CPAC, Fujian Communities Associations of Canada, Fuzhou Changli Guild of Canada, New Immigrants Foundation for Special Needs, Canadian Chinese Conservative Association, Lufu United Association, Global Medic, North American Pan Pacific Cultural Economy and Trade Exchange Association, Artistry Club Academy, Unionville Academy, Investar Global in Financial Group, Ars Fine Foods, EnviroServe, Shirak Bulur, Canada Immigration Service Network Inc., Gourmet City, Link Global Food Inc., GPC International Inc., Handsome International Trading Limited, Tea Maker, Guangdong Fong Li Yuan, Biopharmaceutical Technology Company Limited, Nancheng Zheng Cheng Medical Equipment Company, Sense of New Inc. Thank you very much, Mr. Member Statements. The member for Key Wetnong. Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, I'm rising today uh, to speak again on treaties in this House. Uh, First Nations people across uh, Ontario continue to honour our trees by sharing the territories, the waters, and the natural resources. Our ancestors signed treaties so that, that our territories across Ontario could be shared peacefully between settlers and the Anishinaabe people. We were all meant to prosper. The Crown through Ontario has a role to play in this relationship. First Nations cannot be the only ones holding the holding up their side of the treaties. I want to be very clear. Recent legislative changes, such as Bill 97, do nothing to uphold the treaty relationship. My friends from uh, Fort Albany made a statement in July on Bill 197 that I would like to share. They say, we have watched this with alarm, as our Muskeg, Muskeg homeland in Northern Ontario is one of the main targets of this government's economic agenda, particularly through the Ring of Fire. The Muskeg is the foundation of our identity and our culture. It is one of the most important and delicate peatland ecosystems in the world, with a critical role in storing carbon that would otherwise accelerate climate change. Leaders across the North are clear. Development in the, our territories will not happen with our free, prior, informed consent. The lands, the waters, and our way of life is too important. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Member statements, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. I'm proud to rise today to mark a very important celebration in my community of Scarborough Guildwood. This weekend, the Guildwood Tennis Club celebrated their 50th anniversary with a remarkable socially distanced gathering in the club's courts. At the celebration, I heard many wonderful stories and anecdotes about how the tennis club has touched so many lives across many generations. The club was founded originally as the Kiwanya Wood 
Tennis Club in the 1970s by Bill Shashow, who became the first president, and his wife, Lois, who became the club's treasurer. They served on the club's executive for nearly 32 years. Club members shared stories of sometimes resentfully following the guidance of tennis pro Marina Pereira as children, only to grow up to appreciate her training and athletic success to prove it. Victor Khrushchev, a club member and one of Marina's former students, went on to win the under-12, under-14, under-16, and under-18 Canadian National Championships in singles as well as doubles, and is now attending the University of California, Santa Barbara, on a tennis scholarship. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the club's president, Ron Hochstra, while recovering from a knee injury, um, a knee replacement in fact, he led the opening of the club along with President Dave Muir and Vice President Kathy Cross Carson this summer. And Tennis Canada, in fact, um, trained their national team this summer in Scarborough as a result. Local clubs are instrumental to the success of Tennis Canada and strengthens community ties. Congratulations to the Guildwood Tennis Club. I wish you many more years of success. Thank you very much. Member Statements. The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. It's an honour to rise today to speak about a terrific investment our government is making in my riding of Mississauga Lakeshore. On July 30th, I was privileged to join the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and our Peel Regional Chair, Nando Yanika, to announce a joint federal-provincial investment of $24 million to build 219 affordable homes at two sites in Mississauga Lakeshore. The first project, the Peel Housing Corporation and East Avenue site, will include 151 affordable housing units, including one, two, and three-bedroom apartments for families and seniors. Yesterday, I was proud to attend the launch of the second project by Indwell, which will include 68 affordable one-bedroom apartments for people with disability programs to support them, including addiction services, life skill training. The ground floor will become the new home of the Compass Food Bank, which has been on the front lines of our response to COVID-19 crisis, and I look forward to working with them at their new location. Again, I'd like to thank everyone who has worked so hard on this project, including the minister and his team, and all levels of governments, volunteers, our local churches, and the Port Credit BIA. I know these projects will be a great addition to Mississauga Lakeshore, and I look forward to seeing this come to life over the next several months. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. Like many Ontarians, the increased rate of COVID cases has me worried. This week marks six months since we first started experiencing the very real impact of COVID-19 in Ontario. Majority of the people across the province followed public health advice. Collectively, we made sacrifices to stop the spread of the virus and to flatten the curve. I want to recognize local public health units who rose to the challenge, worked around the clock to protect us and lead us through this public health crisis. We owe a lot to local public health leaders who had the courage to speak up and go above and beyond in the absence of provincial political leadership. In Toronto, we're lucky to have Dr. Eileen de Villa and her team. Speaker, investing in public health means healthy communities. It means saving lives. Public health lowers health care costs by keeping people healthy and safe and out, uh, out of the hospital. However, Premier Ford's damaging cuts to public health weakened the system and left us far less prepared to respond to the pandemic. I urge Premier Ford to listen to local public health units who know what's best for the communities they serve, to reverse the cuts made, and to abandon all plans to merge local public health units. It was their excellent work at the local level that helped us avoid the worst-case scenario in the first wave. We need to strengthen local public health units immediately as we prepare for the second wave and beyond. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last Tuesday morning, the community of South Etobicoke was shaken by a heinous act of violence. Eighty gunshots were fired, and one man was hospitalized with serious injuries in a gang-related shooting, which produced so many gun ca ca casings that the police ran out of evidence tags. When I visited the site of the shooting to speak with business owners and the local BIA, I was shocked to see a daycare right across the street. 
This is not an isolated incident. Unfortunately, Ontario is facing a real growing problem with guns and gang violence. Firearm-related deaths are at a record high levels, and other types of firearm-related violence are also on the rise. More troubling is 80 per cent of guns being used in crimes are obtained by illegal means, including coming from across the border. When these guns get in the hang hands of gangs, violence is almost certain to follow. The police are working hard to do their job, but we need to see the federal government introduce tougher penalties, including mandatory minimum sentences for gun traffickers and those people in possession of illegal firearms. As a parliamentary assistant to the Solicitor General, I am proud of our government's work alongside our local partners to launch our multi-year guns, gangs and violence reduction strategy, which takes a comprehensive approach to public safety, addressing prevention, intervention and enforcement. Illegal possession and use of handguns and assault weapons is a serious concern for all of us. Let's work together to reduce guns and gang violence in Ontario. We must keep all of our communities safe. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The global pandemic has brought indescribable, indescribable challenges to all business. In the face of uncertainty, our governments took action swiftly to listen and address those issues and concerns. I was honored to host an economic reopening roundtable with Premier Ford and the Associate Minister of Small Business and Rate, rate Reduction, Minister Sakaria. There were over 100 small business owners and industry leaders joined our meeting. Many important issues were discussed. We have the opportunity to learn and note the various challenges business in our community encounter. Our government has been focusing on unleashing the power of businesses by reducing rate tap all along. At this time, at this difficult time, we were committed even more in supporting businesses through the Ontario Action Plan and helping business digitalize and modernize. Business owners were so grateful that their voice has been heard. I would like to thank Premier uh, and the Minister Sakaria once again for attending the consultation and engaging in the fruitful discussion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, that concludes our member statements for this morning.